Hannah Arendt's useful phrase, the right to have rights, asks us to consider foundational rights, to consider on what right other rights are based. In her book, The Rights of Others, Shayla ben argues that the first right in Arendt's phrase is addressed to humanity as a call to recognize political membership, where such a right to membership entails legal entitlements, the plural rights. Working with a different literature and calling into question the still predominant North American priority of political rights over economic rights. In his book, Basic Rights, Henry Shu argues that security and subsistence rights are foundational for other rights. In still different fields and sites, theorists in indigenous studies and centuries of indigenous activism have called for land back as foundational to other meaningful economic or political rights. And others in indigenous studies and black studies today have asked theorists, advocates, and organizers to rethink both the strategic reliance on rights claims and a too easy sense that the nation state protects rights. What are we to make of this conceptual instability? What histories, traditions, and cosmologies help us to understand rights claims in new ways? What sites of practice beyond political theory leverage rights in the most useful ways? And what can we learn from these sites, struggles, and celebrations? These are some of the questions we will think about today. All righty, I'm setting up my timer. Okay. Uh, so the paper is entitled The Right to Have Rights, I Think Humanity and Substantive Belonging. Uh, hopefully still, yeah. Uh, so uh, when Hannah Arendt uh, published The Origins of Totalitarianism in 1951, statelessness, and at the time, uh, rightlessness, was the predicament of a post-war Europe. Uh, her criticism of the condition of rightlessness struck right to the heart of the matter in her eloquent criticism of the so-called universal human rights, uh, which since their birth in the 1789 French Declaration had been subject to a plethora of revisions and adoptions without however uh, changing what lay at their core, equality. To be sure, what Arendt diagnosed in this work was not only that human rights were being violated, for that was uh, self-evident, but that statelessness had become a sign of the violation of what she called the right to have rights. What this expression implies in relation to the principle of humanity, which I'll try to make explicit, aims to lay the groundwork for articulating the conditions for the political agency of the refugee anew, while at the same time addressing articles 3, 14, and 28 of the UDHR in the light of this analysis. By taking seriously Arendt's argument that the right to have rights can only be guaranteed by humanity itself, I want to show what a concrete principle of humanity would entail in contrast to a metaphysical, or if you will, ideal or regulative one that has informed previous rights-based accounts of what we owe to refugees. As such, I'll argue that a concrete principle of humanity rests on a performative account of recognition that allows for the appearance of the refugee as a political agent, where such agency rests on an artificial equality that motivates substantive, substantive belonging to a community. Ultimately, I argue that the right to have rights can only be performed by concrete acts carried out by human beings in their togetherness, centrally the act of recognition. Such recognition comprises a phenomenological articulation of Arendt's right to have rights, which can enable us to articulate the conditions of political agency of the refugees that does not merely rest on equal formal, formal or legal membership to a polity, but on an artificial equality that allows for collective world building. The paper will be divided into three sections. Uh, section one deals with the question of world building and agency in Arendt's phenomenology. Uh, two makes the case for Arendt's digression from Kant's articulation of freedom. And three offers a rearticulation of uh, the right to have rights as substantive belonging to allow for the effective exercise of the human rights of refugees. So human rights and world building. Uh, it is hardly controversial that to suggest that a regime of universal human rights aims at the recognition of the human being as the rightful claimant of capacities that would make a life valuable. Uh, this recognition is due to the moral personhood or dignity attributed to human beings, where they're able to not only set, but also pursue their life goals with sufficient safety and liberty. Yet on the other hand, as Wendy Brown describes Michael Ignatieff's uh, pragmatist minimalism, uh, it suggests that, uh, quote, human rights activism is valuable simply because it is effective in limiting political violence and reducing misery. End quote. Understood thus, human rights should aim at least uh, to approximate or approximating the reduction of suffering. This point is important, albeit incomplete. 
the human being as the rightful claimant of these rights also has a voice that cannot be subjected to the arbitrary will of another or silenced without legitimate justification. However, there are people who are not only suffering, but who also have lost their voice and their ability to represent themselves. Among these, we can count undocumented migrants, indigenous peoples, felons, and last but not least, refugees. Um, and it should be noted that here that such a voice is usually understood through political representation or rights uh, that one can exercise as the lawful member of a bounded territory. So the injustice here has both structural and political components. Uh, the regime in which refugees find them, finds themselves harmed by state or other civil agents pose a structural injustice while the lack of voice or representation and effective exercise of their rights is both a structural injustice and a violation of their human rights or their right to have International legal developments that have taken place as Arendt wrote the origins cannot be said to have been in vain regarding the situation in which refugees who are not always uh, necessarily stateless uh, find themselves. The international treatises lay out clearly the right to asylum and other rights that people with refugee status have. However, the two salient features of the convention, the 51 convention definition of a refugee with the uh, provisions of uh, uh, the protocol of 67, uh, namely uh, that they are, quote, outside of their country of origin or habitual residence, and that they cannot go back due to, quote, fear of persecution, make their uh, status as rights bearers quite complicated. Refugees, through no fault of their own, lack the voice that allow them to partake in democratic decision-making processes that pertain to their own fate, since most refugees escape places where legitimate authority is uh, in question or, question or has fallen or where there's an ongoing civil war or where they're in fear of being persecuted due to some particular group membership. Uh, simply put, uh, the refugees' political agency is put on hold. Uh, they effectively do not have a place to which they belong and a proper addressee to have their voices heard. As Aaron puts it in the origins, quote, the fundamental deprivation of human rights is manifested first and above all in the deprivation of a place in the world which makes opinions significant and actions effective, end quote. The simple fact becomes more curious when we look at a few articles of the UDHR in our Declaration of Human Rights that the UN has adopted in 1948 that is supposed to enlist universal human rights that each human being has. Article three says everyone has the right to life and uh, li liberty and security of the person. Article 14.1 suggests everyone has the right to seek and enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. Article 28 says everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can be fully realized. Needless to say, a person seeks refuge when their, quote, right to life, liberty, and security of the person is in danger. More specifically, when one loses their ability to exercise liberty and their security is threatened, they try to escape or flee the situation, at least save their life, and also recover the possibility of living a good one. The lived experience of having no security and living in a present, present constant fear is not conducive to having life plans or any sense of future. This strongly echoes Hobbes' depiction of a life of life in a state of nature that is not only nasty, brutish, and short, but also solitary. The absence of belonging to a community, apart from the forced or imaginary community of refugees whose individuality is seldom recognized presents a sense state of isolation that is not just spatial, but also experienced through the inability to be understood, for instance, due to not speaking the language of the arrival court or state uh, to which one flees. Such a situation does not, of course, render the refugee merely a voiceless victim. That one does not simply give up on life or does not wish to submit to persecution is all in line with the, in line with the agency of the human being. We simply want to choose how we want to live. In the current international legal regime, national belonging coupled with moral agency or freedom allows for such a choice. What happens then when one's national belonging is diminished or destroyed? One still has the ability to exercise their agency. Uh, thus, the right to asylum has two parts, to seek and to enjoy it. Um, the human right to nationality, and this is like a little thing I haven't expanded on yet, but the human right to nationality comes after the right to asylum in the UDHR. And even though some commentators have read RN's right to have rights as a, as a right to nationality, I don't quite agree. The seeming simplicity of the right to asylum is deceiving in a twofold manner. One, the right to asylum cannot be effectively exercised when one does not have or has limited means to actually seek asylum. 
And two, the right does not correspond to a duty on any particular state agent as the addressee of the claim. The challenge of the human right of, of human rights then is not remedied by ones uh, as Article 28 suggests, uh, quote, entitlement to a social and international order in which these rights can be fully realized. But such entitlement becomes a re reason to continue working on realizing these rights. Um, one first needs to be in a place where they can be visible as moral agents to be able to then decide out of their own volition whether they wish to obtain, uh, for instance, such membership or citizenship in that place. In the following, I wish to offer a new way to think about the agency of refugees with the help of an Arendtian paradigm of political phenomenology. If we understand the right to have rights as a concrete principle of humanity that motivates or grounds, if you will, a right to substantive belonging, then we can articulate the area in between being placeless and what we may deem formal belonging that depends on which type of passport you have. World building. Uh, in her 1943 essay, We Refugees, Arendt describes the homelessness and the threefold loss of agency of the agency of the refugee, along with the rupture of private life thus, quote, we lost our home, which means the familiarity of daily life. We lost our occupation, which means the confidence that we're of some use in this world. We lost our language, which means the naturalness of reactions, the simplicity of gestures, the unaffected expression of feelings, end quote. Refugees do not only lose their homes, occupations, and language, but they also lose the ability to represent themselves and take part in the political decisions that, decisions that affect their own lives, present and future. Arendt's description revolves around common tenets of human life that tend to provide a sense of self to the individual, a home, an occupation, and language. All things that present the conditions for the capacity for moral and political agency. Prima facie then, refugees lose the capacity to act politically understood both in terms of representation or like political opinion via voting and deliberation as participation in decision-making. First, the refugee does not have recourse to vote or run for office, the two main political rights that people have in democratic, liberal democratic societies. Second, following again the Arantine political paradigm, where political action emerges amongst human beings which manifest their political freedom, freedom, the refugee has lost the venue and along with it, the ability to deliberate and decide with others what enterprises to embark on. In many cases, this can be as simple as partaking in a city council to decide on the next developmental project for the downtown business. Furthermore, a salient feature of the ex exercise of such political freedom is the capacity of collective world building. Minimally speaking, to be actualized, this capacity of world building requires a place in the world where one is recognized as a member of society. Shayla Ben Habib elucidates this condi condition thus, quote, for our own freedom is world building with others and requires a place in the world within which we are situated in networks of action and interaction. It is only because we're bodies in space that we also need a place in the world. So what is world building? Arendt first discusses the capacity of world building in the context of the necessary component of reification found in the production of human artifice in the human condition, which in turn becomes the condition of possibility of free, act, free human action in politics. Next she, takes, next, she takes it up in the context of the American and French revolutions and on revolution to argue that while uh, American revolutionaries were aiming at world building, their French counterparts ended up destroying the very fabric of the potential world they imagined by collapsing it into terror in the aftermath of the revolution. Thus, world building is both a production and an action. Her conclusion rests on a few premises that I'll try to analyze in the following. Premise one, world building is an active creation of collective political action. Premise two, collective political action manifests freedom versus domination or like an opposition to domination. Uh, intermediate conclusion is world building is itself freedom manifesting and is political. I've argued this in a previous paper before. Uh, I'm happy to share that later on. Uh, premise three, uh, such freedom can take place then with, when there is a place for the human beings to appear in their plurality and uniqueness. And in conclusion, world building requires a space in which human beings appear to each other in their plurality and uniqueness. Such appearance I'll show is also conditioned upon the proper recognition of individuals in their unique and varying social identities that are of course prone to, uh, prone to reduction by groupings, which becomes the possibility of recognizing their, their political agency. Such a space of appearances, as Aaron calls it, is related to the capacity and freedom of action. Hence it, re hence it requires the recognition of the individual as an acting agent. This condition is neither satisfied in a refugee camp or a detention center. 
My argument then is in a nutshell that the right to have rights is the right to substantive belonging to a community uh, that rests on a concrete principle of humanity. There are two passages about world building, but I'm trying to be cautious about time. So I'm gonna leave these aside, but uh, she, this is the human, uh, human artifice or like human life insofar as it, it's world building is about uh, building artifice or like producing worldly, the worldliness of things. And the other one I'll just quote partially is from On Revolution. Uh, there's an element of the world building capacity of men in the faculty of making and keeping promises. Just as promises and agreements deal with the future and provide stability in the ocean of future uncertainty where the unpredictable may break in off from, from all sides. So the constituting founding and world building capacities of men concern always not so much ourselves and our time on earth as our successor and posterities, et cetera. On the one hand, Arendt's articulation underscores the material materiality of the world that is built by human beings, much like the natural right theorists who drive the right to property from the ability to produce and mix one's labor into nature or like our common earth. I'll not discuss the details of the results or the significance of the articulation of such appropriation and the resulting expropriation, but I believe that we'll come to it through like uh, the question of settler colonialism later on. Nevertheless, the grounding of human rights by way of property rights, rights will at least rhetorically suffice to point out that placelessness or having lost your place in the world not only weakens human capacities to the point of eliminating them as valuable options, it also destabilizes the world itself and eliminates one's rightful place in it. That such that this destabilization is not a mere metaphor can be seen in the recent Russian invasion of Ukraine as well as in the ongoing Syrian civil war. Arendt differs from the natural right theorist of modernity in that her formula of world building ultimately does not depoliticize the activity of production. And this was Marx's analysis in the Jew, on the Jewish question, uh, but rather demonstrates that it's conditioned upon the human faculty of keeping, making and keeping promises, which are, which are key to the emergence and continuation of, of, of political, political life. Okay, I'm gonna skip over a few things about Kant and Marx, amazing stuff. Uh, just a little bit, for Arendt, making and keeping promises become the antidote for the frailty of the realm of human affairs. Human beings who cannot control for the outcomes of their actions need to be able to make promises with the intention to keep them. It is important, however, to note that the only frailty in human affairs does not rest on the unpredictability of outcomes, but it's also the uncertainty of material conditions and whether people have access to a home and more importantly, to a community of equals. So what is at stake in making and keeping promises? Simply put, the ability to make and keep promises is a manifestation of human freedom. Making a promise is different from being forced to do something. Uh, I promise to meet you at the town square at one, one o'clock tomorrow. Uh, quote, three things, if, a proposition, three things inherent in the promise are that I want to meet you, that I want to trust that I will meet, I want you to trust that I will meet you, and that if something more urgent were to come up, I may fail to keep my promise out of my own volition, that I'm free, or a free to keep or fail to keep my promise. This couldn't happen in a Hobbesian state of nature as whatever binds me in for internal would not necessarily be binding in for external. Thus the better social contract, if you will, rests on a Kantian framework. For Kant, external right is only, or the ability to exercise our freedoms is only guaranteed in a civil condition. There's so many things about Kant here that I will uh, skip over just one thing. That is my alarm. I'll give myself one more minute, maybe, but that's okay. The innate right of humanity. So this was the comparison point for me between Kant and Arendt to show why Arendt diverges from it. But the innate right of humanity, as Kant had originally articulated, is simply the innate right to freedom, which he understands as a capacity, one's capacity to be one's own master. Uh, so the similarity, uh, so for Kant, uh, the reason of being of the political is freedom. And Hannah Arendt said the same thing. So like, wait a second. Uh, notwithstanding the similarity in the core of their political thinking, the contrast between two are stark. While Kant understands the fundamental human condition to be one of sovereignty, Arendt highlights the relational aspect of human existence of, and rights. Uh, da, 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 da. If you'll give me one second, I'll go over this one. Uh, so what is happening here, like one last thing to suggest is that the way in which Hannah Arendt brings to the fore the phenomenological understanding of humanity or like of, of the capacity and human condition of freedom uh, is, uh, is contrasting a little bit Kant's right of freedom resting on a principle of humanity, that which posits that the human being is an end in itself that is worthy of respect who cannot be utilized as a mere means or bought and sold, et cetera. While this principle is appealing, 
the respect for such a principle remains negative in its form that by way of not acting to, for instance, violate the other, one can still be acting on a principle of humanity that does not in the end allow for the cultivation of the capacity for one's freedom. A concrete example of this could be the refugee camp. One's rights are not necessarily by, violated by their residents in a refugee camp, but they do not have the conditions right for being equal participants in society, neither actualizing their freedom to act according to their own or collective ends. Uh, so skipping over and coming to the end, uh, what I want to say uh, is that the way in which we can understand the uh, right to have rights, as, Anna, as Hannah Arendt puts it in the origins, uh, points to the site for political, for the exercise of political agency, rather than just like a legal uh, membership in a polity is how I understand. So I think there is a response in Hannah Arendt to the paradox of democracy uh, on the one hand, like you know, being able to respect human rights claims universally, and then being able to uh, respect the self-determination of the state of a bounded territory. So what I want to suggest in the end, bringing together the, uh, the articles 3, 14, and 28 with which I started, substantive belonging, I think at least uh, motivates uh, five uh, ways in which we can understand uh, the uh, concrete principle of humanity, and I'll say this and I'll shut up. One of them is the right to work, uh, to be of use in the world and be self-subsistent. The other one, the second one is right to education and language courses where necessary, to be able to have the opportunity to create and pursue life plans, to understand what goes on in one's environment and to be understood. Three, right to healthcare, to have the basic condition to continue living and working as one does. Four, right to childcare, to have the ability to not choose between caregiving and doing what is necessary to live and flourish. And five, the right to move, to recover a sense of self that is not immobilized or oppressed. So in a sense, what we can understand uh, to, be, uh, to be promoting an artificial equality by way of articulating the right to have rights from the substantive belonging uh, aspect or dimension is for such rights, such material rights and conditions to be in place uh, for the refugee or resettled refugee or anybody else to be able to practice their political agency. And I think I'll stop right there. Thank you so much for bearing with me. And uh, yeah. Thank you. It's always good to hear your work. I'm thinking you said toward the middle something that you disagree with the readings that want to stress that the right to have rights is first about a right to nationality. Could you say a little bit more about what that disagreement is? Oh, you're still um, muted. Yeah. Got it, yeah. Uh, that was, I think, the quote of 2020. Yeah, like, you're on mute. Uh, but in any case, yeah. So the way in which I think about it is that the, and this is also a very Kant thing, or like a criticism of Kant and this like Rawlsian analysis, if you will, of uh, being belonging to a territory by way of uh, common descent or language or nationality. So when I think about uh, national identity as decoupled, yeah, uh, from both language or like the belonging to be like, okay, belonging to a people versus belonging to a state, which Hannah Arendt takes up in the Gauss interview saying that she never felt like she belonged to the folk but she felt like she belonged to the German state. Yeah, and that was the language aspect of things. So to me, uh, the right to have rights, the ability to be able to claim rights is not about uh, being of the same nationality or being involved in that nationality per se, uh, but to be able to be a member and potentially equal member of a community where you can make decisions about your life and others' lives or like just discuss the worldly stakes um, that are important for us. Uh, does that help a little bit? Because this is really, I mean, it's again like the this is this is perhaps the against the uh, national liberalist uh, camp uh, that wants to suggest that you know things should be or like refugee or the influx, the movement of migrants or other like uh, refugees should be uh, stopped or should be limited uh, because they wouldn't be uh, similar to our culture and hence would be a threat. Um, yeah, I'll say that much for now. Is that good, Ben? Yeah, that is good. I'm wondering if anyone uh, yeah, else has any questions before yeah. we move to Katie. You can take 10 seconds to think and jot things down. <laughs> <laughs> 
someone in the chat is thanking you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, well, let's keep thinking. And for now, well, let's move to um, KD Star. Okay, um, great. Yeah, so I, I mean, so first of all, yeah, um, the Aspen stock gave me a lot to think about. And, and I think actually, you know, what, what I'll talk about um, gets at, um, at least toward the end of the paper, something, something um, to what, to what Yasmin is talking about with substantive belonging, especially that last, um, that last right, the right to mobility or movement is something that, that I'm thinking about a bit in this talk. I uh, was not able to print my talk out, so I am gonna be like reading off of the screen um, <laughs> and just like staring at the screen ostensibly. But, um, so I'll start, let me just start by saying that one thing that might be somewhat um, sort of lesser known is that Arendt published dozens of articles in um, popular presses, Jewish presses, German language presses, um, beginning in the 1930s. And I've been interested for a long time in thinking about how those more journalistic writings, especially those gathered in, in the volume, uh, the, the Jewish writings that was sort of compiled uh, by Jerome Cohn, um, how some of these writings might relate or come to bear on her philosophical thinking. And so this talk is an attempt to sort of situate and think through some of those connections. Um, and, and as well to, to give me an opportunity to think through a more recent work, uh, Jasper Puar's The Right to Maim, which I'm trying to sort of understand the implications of uh, through Arendt. Um, but I would also, I just wanted to note here at the beginning that um, the Judith Butler's essays on Arendt in her book, Parting Ways, um, which are sort of engaging in, with the Jewish writings in, in more depth than I'm going to be able to do today, um, that I would point to, to that text for folks who are, are interested in the Jewish writings. Okay, so let's see. In the origins of totalitarianism, I already need a drink of water. In the origins of totalitarianism, Hannah Arendt traces the process by which a condition of rightlessness is produced so that the right to life can be challenged. Um, this account of statelessness, which Arendt understands expansively as the loss of a place in the world that guarantees humanity, um, provides both a critique of universal human rights as inadequate, as well as the basis for a recognition of what she calls the right to have rights. So here I understand the right to have rights. Um, I think similarly to, to Yasmin as um, an exercise or enactment of a right to struggle for rights. As I'll argue, the right to have rights is thus a theory of action uh, rooted in a principle of belonging, an early articulation of the plural non-sovereign theory of political action that Arendt develops in her later works, especially the human condition, um, but also on revolution and some of those things. Um, yet it's only through the close historical analysis of statelessness and nation state politics that she says we become aware of the right to have rights. So in my own reading of Arendt today then, I, I take both the historical uh, and philosophical aspects of her theorization seriously. And in this talk, I'll, I'll try to bring an analysis of her early uh, journalistic writings of the 1930s and 40s, together with the more robustly theoretical works on action and politics post origins of totalitarianism. Specifically, I focus on statelessness as the site where the right to life is challenged and the right to have rights becomes legible. Turning to Arendt's early critique of Zionism, the paper develops an account of settler colonialism as producing a new statelessness, a state of suspension held in suspension. That is a dispossession that must be produced and maintained as incomplete. This interminable dispossession requires a different model uh, for theorizing sovereign power. It may point instead to the biopolitics 
of what Jadbir Puar has recently termed the right to maim. And so this is an idea that I'm thinking through here. The right to maim or the exercise of sovereign power as an ongoing activity that simultaneously injures and sustains. Unlike the older formulations of sovereign power inherent in the right to kill and the right to expulsion noted in Arndt's analysis of statelessness, the right to maim involves different structures and goals. What kind of sovereignty, asked Puar, is being articulated when the right to kill is enacted as the right to maim? Puar develops a, a powerful sort of indictment of Israeli military violence, arguing that the ongoing bodily and infrastructural debilitation of the Palestinian population targets resistance and not merely life itself. Uh, from an Arendtian perspective, the potential for resistance can only be extinguished when the minimal conditions for being together have been eradicated. This idea is theorized at length in philosophical works, especially a human condition, but it's nascent in her formulation of the right to have rights, which identifies place and, belong and belonging as the core of plural enactment. As Judith Butler has rightly argued, however, this mode of enactment still requires material infrastructures to support it. One question I have in mind then is whether the right to maim, understood as the production of debility, including debilitating infrastructures that quote, restrict mobility for nearly everyone, albeit unevenly and differently, end quote, whether um, the right to maim thus targets the material conditions for the right to have rights. Right. So, um, Moving now into sort of the body of the paper, Arendt considered statelessness the defining political experience of the 20th century, not only because she viewed the massive scale of the problem as unprecedented, but because of the significant geopolitical and philosophical issues that the existing, or that the existence of increasing numbers of stateless people exposed as untenable. The arrival of the stateless people uh, she argues, laid bare certain dangers in here, inherent in the structure of the modern nation state, namely brutal forces of homogenization, um, and brought to light certain perplexities inherent in the concept of human rights, i.e. the question of their philosophical foundation and practical enforceability. Since inalienable means in part separable from all governments, Arendt points to the troubling fact that the hard case inalienable human rights are meant to cover the stateless, they precisely cannot cover. This is a situation that as Arendt describes in chapter nine of Origins, the decline of the nation state and the end of the rights of man. This is a situation that emerging totalitarian governments of the 20th century were only too eager to take advantage of. The older domain of sovereign power, the right to kill was supplemented by a sovereign right of expulsion. Wielding the weapon of denaturalization, a condition of complete rightlessness was created, she says, so that the right to live could be challenged. Arendt explains that this process involved a series of deprivations, beginning with the deprivation of legality, of legal status and civil rights, and ending with the deprivation of a place in the world, which forced the stateless, um, and Arendt is particularly talking about the Jewish people and origins, which forced the stateless out of humanity altogether. Arendt emphasizes that it is, quote, not the loss of specific rights then, but the loss of a community willing and able to guarantee any rights whatsoever that has been the calamity which has befallen ever increasing numbers of people. <clears throat> man, it turns out, can lose all uh, so-called rights of man without losing his essential quality as man, his human dignity. Only the loss <clears throat> of a polity itself expels him from humanity, end quote. So as I'll explore later, uh, Jeff Berpour's recent work, The Right to Maim, <clears throat> exposes a further supplement to the traditional exercise of sovereign power that seems to flip this formulation on its head, targeting not the right to life, but rather the right to die. Arendt, clearly harboring a deep suspicion for the kind of philosophically ungrounded universalisms that characterized political modernity, turned to the minimalism of what she termed the right to have rights. Contrary to what um, some scholars have concluded, 
Uh, the right to have rights does not simply refer to a right to belong to a state that guarantees certain rights, at least not on my reading. Statelessness is not exhausted uh, by rightlessness understood as the deprivation of legal and political status. As the quotation above suggests, and as I've argued elsewhere, and so here I'm going to sort of be referring to um, uh, an argument that I put forth in an earlier work, the phenomenon of statelessness is not characterized solely by exposure to violence and uncertainty characteristic of rightlessness, but by threat of the total deprivation of any belonging in the world whatsoever. And I'll quote Arendt at length here from The Origins. She says, the calamity of the rightless is not that they're deprived of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or of equality before the law and freedom of opinion, formulas which were designed to solve problems within given communities, but that they no longer belong to any community whatsoever. Their plight is not that they are not equal before the law, but that no law exists for them, not that they're oppressed, but that nobody even wants to oppress them. The prolongation of their lives is due to charity and not to right, for no law exists which could force the nations to feed them. The fundamental deprivation of human rights is manifested first and above all in the deprivation of a place in the world which makes opinion significant and actions effective." End quote. So what exactly does <clears throat> the deprivation of a place in the world consist in? And what does the loss of opinion and action signify? For Arendt, action is not so much a capacity as a potentiality, one that we exercise whenever we have access to a place in the world with others. Thus, belonging is itself a political project that results in a kind of politics. And our relations with others in their plurality constitute the primary resource for our political capacities, a minimal resource born out from our shared condition of interdependency or dependency. As Arendt explores in later works, uh, this is clear in the case of revolution, of state founding, of covenant and alliance, of any action in concert. And it is the meaning of the right to have rights that they are attained through their enactment. Thus, unlike the traditional formulation of universal human rights that aren't critiques and origins, the right to have rights does not entail a rights bearing subject. And as we know, the category delineating who counts as a rights bearing subject uh, fluctuates historically and geographically. Um, but the right to have rights instead entails a rights enacting subject. The threat of non-belonging, of, of worldlessness or placelessness, as Yasmin said, is thus vulnerability of an altogether different order. What is at stake are the modes of relating that make political action, including resistance, possible. Not the deprivation of a state, but the deprivation of a place in the world. Um, quote, this extremity and nothing else is the situation of people deprived of human rights. They are deprived not of the right to freedom, but of the right to action, not of the right to think whatever they please, but of the right to opinion, end quote. Arendt's use of the word deprivation here is difficult. How can the right to action or something like the right to opinion be deprived? Enigmatic formulations like right to action and right to opinion only make sense if we understand that for Arendt, both action and opinion, two essential components of the political, are specifically plural and intersubjective concepts. From her discussion of action in the human condition, we know that action not only requires an agent, but a community that bears and completes what that agent puts into motion. To be isolated, she writes, is to be deprived of the capacity to act. So if we look at the formulation right to action given in the origins against the backdrop of Arendt's broader political theory, then the deprivation of the right to action amounts to a deprivation um, of this community of plural individuals before whom we appear and with whom we act in concert. Again, this is not to say the deprivation of a particular kind of community, um, for instance, the nation state, but the deprivation of any community whatsoever. By formulating the deprivation of a human right to politics as the deprivation of, um, sorry, as the deprivation, 
as the deprivation of a place in the world, Arendt actually opens up the theoretical space for thinking an extra state or a stateless politics. Action is undertaken with and between our fellows and the condition for the possibility of our ability to act is provided most minimally in the existence of this community of others. But as Judith Butler has shown, uh, we require material and infrastructural conditions that sustain us in our interactions. And it's not always the case that these material conditions exist prior to the actions that demand them. As a result, we often find ourselves um, in the course of performative political action, making demands for the very material conditions to sustain that politics. This new situation writes around in which humanity has in effect assumed the role formally ascribed to nature or history would mean in this context that the right to have rights or the right of every individual to belong to humanity should be guaranteed by humanity itself. Adding, quote, it is by no means certain whether this is possible, end quote. The foundation for humanity and human rights is now the ungrounded plane of human action. Within the nation state system, this articulation of the right to have rights necessitates national emancipation. Reading Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism alongside her general, journalistic writings published between the 1930s and 1960s on Zionism and the state of Israel, it becomes evident that Arendt was skeptical from very early on that the nation state could be a solution to the complex of issues that statelessness names, or rather that that national emancipation could be a solution. As Judith Butler writes in Parting Ways, Jewishness and the Critique of Zionism, quote, in Origins, Arendt attempted to show how, for structural reasons, the nation state produces mass numbers of refugees and must produce them in order to maintain the homogeneity of the nation it seeks to represent, in other words, to support the nationalism of the nation state. This led her to oppose any state formation that sought to reduce or refuse the homogeneity of its population, including um, the founding of Israel on principles of Jewish sovereignty, end quote. Um, Butler traces these views to essays such as uh, Zionism Reconsidered and an essay titled To Save the Jewish Homeland, published in the 1940s, uh, where Arendt specifically criticizes the exclusionary models of national belonging that political Zionism draws from and worried about the security uh, of a Jewish nation state, asserting that the creation of a Jewish state could only come at the price of the Jewish homeland. Obviously, these were very controversial views then and now. As Butler shows, the historical and political account of statelessness developed in origins and in the Jewish writings allows Arendt to quote, derive general principles that oppose the reproduction of stateless persons and persons without rights, end quote. And so now I'm gonna quote Arendt at length from the origins of totalitarianism uh, where she gestures to um, this broad, broader principle in her thinking. She writes that quote, after the war, it turned out that the Jewish question, which was considered the only insoluble one, was indeed solved, namely by means of a colonized and then conquered territory, but this solved neither the problem of the minorities nor the stateless. On the contrary, like virtually all other events of our century, the solution of the Jewish question merely produced a new category of refugees, the Arabs, thereby increasing the number of the stateless and rightless by another 700,000 to 800,000 people, since the peace treaties of 1919 and 1920, the refugees and the stateless have attached themselves like a curse to all the newly established states on earth, which were created in the image of the nation state." End quote. So in this passage, Arendt uh, contends that um, given this, this nation state system of politics, national emancipation inevitably produces dispossession but she also raises questions about the nature of the relationship between uh, these newly emancipated nation states and the newly stateless. Right. So before turning to those questions, I'll note that 
Throughout her work, Arnett rightly resists easy analogies between the histories of Jewish statelessness and Palestinian statelessness. The contemporary geopolitical situation is certainly different than it was in 1948. Among these many differences, I find it significant to, to note the ambiguous status of Palestinians as stateless on Arendt's um, original sort of conceptualization of statelessness. Indeed, while fixed in territory, Palestine <clears throat> occupies no fixed or unambiguous place within international law. Not entirely state, not entirely stateless, this characteristic ambiguity signals a new and even deeper statelessness. For Palestinians, the process of political and territorial dispossession is ongoing, and therefore uh, the realization of statelessness under Arendt's original model is, uh, is not complete and may in fact be interminable. The process of statelessness itself, uh, which is a kind of state of suspension, is itself being held in suspension. In more than one way, one could say that the Palestinian dispossession is itself being dispossessed. It is this idea of an incomplete dispossession or an equivocal statelessness that I think Jasbir Puar um, helps to get at in her analysis of debilitation. Um, so just a couple minutes left here, um, I'm gonna try to make some connections with Puar. Uh, with debilitation as distinct from disablement, uh, Jasper Puar aims to describe, quote, the slow wearing down of populations. Quote, while disablement creates and hinges on a narrative of before and after for individuals who will eventually be identified as disabled, debilitation comprehends those bodies that are sustained in a perpetual state of debilitation precisely through foreclosing the social, cultural, and political translation to disability, end quote. In the context of Palestine-Israel, Puar argues that the occupation itself is the primary producer of debility, pointing to infrastructures like checkpoints that produce mobility impairments for all, as well as military tactics such as, uh, quote unquote, shoot to cripple, uh, which involves targeting the knees, arms, and internal organs um, in order to produce permanent injury rather than death. So tactics and policies like these that function as um, an effective and overlooked method of biopolitical uh, governmentality and control. Poor identifies the latter as a deployment of what she calls the right to maim, a supplement to the older right to kill. Quote, if slow death is conceptualized as primarily uh, through the vector of let die or make die, maiming functions as will not let die and its supposed humanitarian complement will not make die. Maiming masquerades as let live, when in fact it acts as will not let die. For example, the idea of policy of shooting to maim, not to kill, is often misperceived as a preservation of life. In this version of attenuated life, neither living nor dying is the aim. Instead, will not let die and will not make die replaced altogether the coordinates make live and let die. It is not only the right to kill, but also the right to maim that is being exercised as the domain of sovereignty." End quote. This formulation, as I gestured earlier, presents a new way of thinking the relationship between sovereign power and individual right. The conflict is no longer between the sovereign right to kill and the individual right to life, but between the sovereign right to maim and the individual right to die. The problem, writes Puar, is not just that death is withheld, as she puts it at one point, but resistance to death is constrained. Referring to policies in Gaza like, uh, like calorie control that result in what is called stunting, um, she writes, quote, the target here is not just life itself, but resistance itself. Targeting youth not for death, but for stunting, for physical, psychological, and cognitive injuries is another aspect of, the, of this biopolitical tactic that seeks to render impotent any future resistance, future capacity to sustain Palestinian life on its own terms, thereby debilitating generational time. It is especially cognitive and psychological injuries that have long range traumatic effects that potentially debilitate any resistant capacities of future generations, 
end quote. Poor ends this line of argumentation by adding, quote, it is worth stating an obvious but perhaps unremarked upon qualification here. This is a bio biopolitical fantasy that resistance can be located, stripped, and emptied, end quote. So I'll end this too brief engagement with Puar's account in this paper, um, but this too brief engagement with Puar's account of debilitation and maiming by asking what the exercise of sovereign power she describes as targeting resistance means for how we understand the right to have rights today. If the strategy exercised through the right to maim is bodily and infrastructural debilitation that falls just short of killing, then it is not precisely the right to life that is being challenged as, as Arendt originally conceptualized it. In her dis discussion of queer and disability act activism in Palestine, Poirin notes that one way debilitation operates is through mobility restrictions, uh, through the delimitation or prohibition of gathering and organizing, since in many cases, uh, Palestinians in Ramallah, for instance, cannot, quote, cannot travel to Haifa, Jerusalem, or Gaza to meet with fellow Palestinian activists, end quote. As I've argued, the right to have rights describes the exercise of a right to struggle for rights as the very ground of that a priori right. It requires, I've suggested, a kind of togetherness as its minimal condition. What form can and does that struggle take under uh, the debilitating conditions that Puar describes in the right to name? So that's my, that's my uh, ending question. And I will stop there. It went a little longer than I anticipated. My apologies. That's okay. Thank you, Katie. One of the things you said that I want to follow up on is that about a kind of, um, uh, not relying on the state and making these claims. I mean, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that because um, oftentimes it's assumed that a rights claim is directed toward a, a state. And so it seems to me like part of your account could help us think through these moments where there are rights claims being leveraged, but they're, they're not necessarily addressed to the state. They're speaking elsewhere, naming something else. I'm wondering how you're reading that or how you're thinking about that bracketing of the state. Yeah, it's a bit of a puzzle uh, that I've, um, you know, been engaged in trying to untangle. I think that one thing that helps me think about that um, is, is Butler's point that I sort of gestured to earlier, that of course, if, if you're not regarded as a sort of rights bearing subject by the state in the first place, then um, the, the struggle for rights can't be limited to that political framework, um, right? But, but actually sometimes the right to have rights takes the form of a kind of um, external, how do we say, um, an unrecognized, um, Activity to struggle for rights that arises out of a different, um, an external domain of, of sense and meaning or something like that. Um, but, um, but yeah, certainly if the problem is that not um, all those who are human um, or otherwise are recognized as such by particular political political institutions, then of course the struggle for rights can't operate within, within the confines of that delimited political framework. Right? And so the struggle has to arise from outside. Um, and where I think the optimism is, right, is that we don't necessarily have a, a blueprint for, for understanding the forms that those um, political acts might take. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have questions for Katie? I do, but maybe we'll do it at the end. Oh, yeah, Omar? Yeah, if there's time at the end, that would be great. I have a few questions for, for Katie as well. Okay, great. We can save them and then move to Ren. Kia ora, no kia tatou nei. Um, yeah, so mine's quite different. 
So in this brief presentation, I want to consider Hannah Arendt's concept of the right to have rights in relation to another concept, that of indigenous rights, which lies outside her frame of reference. And I'm just going to share my screen. <clears throat> Indigenous rights is recognised in the UN, uh, UN's 2007 Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, for instance, as a term of recent coining. Among other rights, it recognises that of Indigenous self-determination. This is not a right to secession, but to determine one's community life, empowering Indigenous reclamation of land, culture, language and identity, while obliging states that surround Indigenous peoples to observe, protect and enable such reclamation. As you probably know, the declaration is non-binding. Ben's asked us to consider whether Arendt's notion of the right to have rights is useful when thinking about alternative rights, histories, and traditions. I took this question to be, what is the right to, for instance, indigenous rights? Where does such a right originate? My theoretical engagement with these questions concern relations between rights discourses and historical ones, for instance, how rights discourses articulate with particular histories, how rights are shaped historically, how specific historical discourses gain significance from their association with or amplification of rights claims, and how rights demand historical reckonings while emancipating themselves from the depletion of historical time. UNDRIP does not resolve the question of foundations for, for Indigenous rights. On one account, the foundational right to Indigenous rights surely originates in Indigenous peoples' ancient political communities that pre-existed Aravaste or settler colonial states and have, that have survived despite dispossession, decimation, exploitation and attempts to break up family life. Locating a right to Indigenous rights within Indigenous law may entail a number of cultural, linguistic and conceptual translations from particular Indigenous customary contexts into a European rights tradition. Some scholars therefore argue that rights frameworks are not useful and in fact distort indigenous epistemo ontologies. Nonetheless, other indigenous scholars in many parts of the world in North and South America, the South Pacific and Northern Scandinavia are working on projects that reactivate and reassert indigenous law on such a foundational basis. This work complements that being done by scholars of Asia and Africa who seek to ground human rights discourses in local and regional legal and moral traditions. Here it's worth clarifying our terms. In the Americas, the South Pacific and Northern Scandinavia in the mid to late 20th century, indigenous came to mean something quite specific. Native in an older binary imperial discourse indicated a much wider group of, of colonized peoples and distinguished them from settlers. Following formal decolonization in the mid 20th century, indigenous has often come to refer to a more limited group of people, those who are not seeking or are un unlikely to achieve uh, independent st sovereign statehood as the UN declaration highlights, yet whose experience of colonialism is not a matter of the past given that these indigenous nations are still surrounded by settler or non-indigenous nation states. In making this distinction between native and indigenous, I refer to the discourse of indigenous rights conjured in UNDRIP um, and in other work I've talked about this as post-colonial but in a complicated way. In this sense, post-colonial refers not to a period following the achievement of national independence for indigenous peoples, Rather, it underscores the fact that Indigenous rights is both a discourse of resistance to colonialism and an insistence on the continued salience and meaningfulness of some colonial era forms of recognition, tribal reservations in the United States, for instance. As I mentioned, post-colonial Indigenous rights recognised in state and international law do not encompass a right to secession. Instead, a notion of self-determination has been reworked. In some places, it denotes a degree of internal autonomy rather than, rather than external sovereignty, as the UN Declaration makes clear. This poses new challenges to nation states uh, and even prompts a rethinking of the hyphenation of nationhood with state sovereignty. As well as affirming Indigenous self-determination and the right of Indigenous people to continue community life undisturbed, UNDRIP and other related documents reference existing treaty land and customary rights on, uh, several times. These references suggest another origin for 
Indigenous rights, not only in pre-colonial Indigenous societies, but also in the histories of encounter and ensuing development of political relations between non-Indigenous and Indigenous peoples. The paradigmatic encounter is that between Europeans and Indigenous peoples. However, UNDRIP is meant to be applicable to non-European contexts of colonisation and usurpation as well. <clears throat> in these references to historical examples of interpolity recognition, um, I'm taking a term from Adam Clulo and uh, Lauren Benton, a treaty, uh, for instance, a treaty, a right to have Indigenous rights is established in two senses. First, by entering into treaty relations, participants recognise each other's political status as such, even if they do so unequally. Second, the terms of the treaty establish promises, expectations and norms for ongoing interpolity engagement. A right to have Indigenous rights in this context refers to the legal relations that developed in the making of such encounters on the cusp of, but not necessarily anticipating the formation of the settler state. In other words, Indigenous rights considered in this historical sense are thresholds or bridges in some accounts, rights that lie at the foundation or just before the making of the state, connecting it back to a pre-state world. The right to have Indigenous rights is thus guaranteed by a state that is forced to apprehend, reluctantly and often anxiously, its own location and time. The right to Indigenous rights is thus uniquely powerful in the sense that it is embedded in the fabric of the state, but it's also distinctively vulnerable to the state's attempts to conceal its own origins as it strives for immemoriality. Histories of encounter of relationship making and often relationship breaking as the foundational context for a right to Indigenous rights offer a counterpoint to the history underpinning Arendt's argument. Um, and I'm not trying to hold Arendt to account for not grappling with an idea that wasn't um, you know, that salient in her time, Indigenous self-determination, or at least not in the terms and with the wider currency that it has today. I don't want to critique her for what she didn't know, but what I'm interested in exploring is how the historical argument that underpins her concept of the right to have rights submerges other histories, ones that have re-emerged in public and scholarly discourse, including that of political theory in more recent decades. <clears throat> in chapter nine of the origins of totalitarianism, as we've been hearing, Arendt argues that the foundation for human rights originates not in an idea of abstract man, but through means belonging in actual political communities. Importantly, Arendt's claim refuses the idea of human rights in abstract terms, not rights of man, but of men. And I take this to be um, grounding her story in uh, actual historical processes. She insists that inalienable rights, in fact, only exist for those for whom such rights can be enforced because they're already citizens of a state. And the state then acts as guarantor and enforcer of an individual's human rights. By focusing on the modern condition of statelessness, her argument reveals as illusory the nation state's promise of equality for all. Statelessness is a historical condition, the consequence of convulsions in Europe following the breakup of the Ottoman and Austro-Hungarian empires after World War I and the weaponizing of national status by totalitarian regimes, particularly that of the Nazis. But what her inquiry into the historical conditions for statelessness reveals is an existential predicament that not all humans, even European ones, in fact, have human rights. Once they're denationalized as the Jews in Germany were en masse, they no longer have the capacity to insist on or win recognition for their so-called inalienable human rights. So Arendt argues, despite the fact that human rights promise equality and dignity for all, they're really only available to those who already bear the rights of citizens. Such rights can be taken away by the states that serve to protect them. As the italicized sentence in the excerpt on the slide highlights, Arendt's argument draws for its background on a theoretical distinction between the civilized who live in political community and the uncivilized, also the backwards or the savage in her text, who do not. In another part of the chapter, she makes this explicit, quote, if a tribal or other backward community did not enjoy human rights, 
It was obviously because as a whole, it had not yet reached that stage of civilization, the stage of popular and national sovereignty, but was oppressed by foreign or native despots. The, the distinction between the civil and the savage is, of course, one deeply rooted in European political thought and other civilizational discourses too. However, as Arendt points out at several times in the argument in the chapter, what the condition of statelessness lays bare is that the distinction between the civil and the savage is no longer the most significant one for establishing who can or cannot claim rights. Now all the world has been civilized, often by force. All presumably can make some claim to rights. As she puts it in the excerpt above, there is, quote, no longer any uncivilized spot on earth because whether we like it or not we have we have really started to live in one world however to assume that such universality makes for universal human rights is according to Arendt to miss the paradox of the creation of a world of nation states in one world a universal project of civil state making has led to the most uncivil of predicaments mass statelessness. In this context, to be expelled from one's nation can mean expulsion from humanity without necessary recourse to a process of, one, of regaining one's civil status. So in this further twist on the right to have rights, Arendt explains that one world is the ambivalent culmination of civilization considered as a historical process that exceeds the territorial space of Europe itself. Although statelessness appears to be a problem originating in Europe in her period, its conditions of possibility lie outside Europe in the completion of a centuries long project of making one world through what she labels imperialism. The advent of one world ma uh, <coughs> makes marks the end of the possibility of what we might call new worlds, or in other words, the history of settler colonization, which in previous centuries allowed those expelled from European states or fleeing perse persecution to claim new homes. It is this history that has come to an end. The culmination of this history with its translation of multiple kinds of polities into the nation state has created conditions for the emergence of a new problem, that of statelessness. Arendt does not spell out all the implications of what the entanglements of Europe and not Europe mean for the right to have rights. She does uh, mention the effective claims of colonial peoples to their right to self-determination. But as I uh, suggested earlier, I doubt that in her mind, this category included those now referred to by UNDRIP as indigenous peoples. Um, and I can go into some of the international law context for that if you're interested too at the time that she was writing. But returning to my earlier observations, <clears throat> one implication that I wish to explore now briefly relates to that submerged history of settler colonization in her account. As I've been suggesting, this history is not elaborated, yet it is in fact crucial to her argument about the making of one world. Once we pay close, closer attention to this history, other stories and rights traditions emerge that were contemporaneous with Arendt's work, but not part of her milieu. For instance, a decade before The Origins was published, the United States Supreme Court found in favor of Wallapai native or Aboriginal uh, title rights, which was itself the outcome of a decades long effort on the part of Wallapai leaders in the Southwest of the United States and activists and sympathetic lawyers. United States versus Santa Fe Pacific Railroad Company 1941 was a critical turning point in the remaking of the discourse of native people's inalienable land title in common law jurisdictions. And it's one that's not only reverberated down the decades in the US, but also in case law in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. In subsequent decades, Indigenous peoples' pursuit of legal cases in all these countries was accompanied by other forms of activism. I've just put a range of examples up here on the slide. 
<clears throat> and political campaigning, including petitioning, mobilizing communities to resist further incursions onto their lands, treaty marches, armed standoffs, and so on. In the 1970s, indigenous leaders, including the Shuswap leader, George Manuel, who coined the term the fourth world, formed uh, international organizations such as the World Council of Indigenous Peoples, which played an early and significant role in getting the matter of indigenous rights attention at the United Nations. If it's true that wide, uh, widespread public and scholarly attention to indigeneity and indigenous rights was yet to come, I'll stop sharing this now, um, was yet to come when Arendt published The Origins, there is a further methodological reason for her lack of attention to the origins for a history of indigenous rights. Arendt's critique of imperialism is primarily concerned with how Europe acted on other parts of the world. The approach does not provide the tools for recovering alternative history, uh, rights histories. Countering the historical argument that buttresses Arendt's claims requires not only the recovery of different events and processes, but also the rethinking of agency and perspective in the writing of history. These developments and methods of scholarly discourse are themselves in part the outcomes of processes of and, and practices of anti-colonialism that were follow uh, that were unfolding when Arendt was writing Origins. One of the consequences of the Wallapai land rights case was the creation of the United States Indian Claims Commission which over three decades investigated treaty breaches and the compensation owed to Native Americans for dispossession. The ICC inquiry process entailed the, mount the mounting of considerable historical and ethnographic evidence, giving rise to a subfield known as ethnohistory. And out of that field would emerge new ideas about intercultural co contact zones or in the historian Richard White's felicitous phrase, the middle ground. White's work, uh, influenced by proponents of ethnohistory and other scholars of cross-cultural inquiry, such as Greg Denning in the Pacific, focused on the fur trading communities of the 17th and 18th century Great Lakes region, where Ben is, in which creative uh, misunderstanding produced a new modus vivendi. These middle ground histories, in which historians have recounted how Europeans and indigenous people had to negotiate terms of trade, exchange, and community life in webs of interdependency, provide us a different account of colonization and indeed of the making of one world. In these accounts, Europe did not act on, but interacted with indigenous societies. These histories contribute to discussions of globalization as multidirectional, non-teleological and unfinished, rather than as a unilinear story by which the not yet civil become civilized. <clears throat> so the first point I want to underline in, in concluding is that a way of thinking about the history of imperialism or colonization that underpinned Arendt's concept of the right to have rights forecloses other histories that indigenous leaders and activists and historical scholars have subsequently nourished. These histories convene different meeting grounds on which to contemplate the foundations of rights discourses, and they provide other resources for political imaginings and disputes in the present. The second point is that stretching Arendt's term in order to probe a right to Indigenous rights forces us to consider the historicity of the state. The problem that emerges, or well, at least I'm interested in, is not um, statelessness per se is the consequence of the state's power to denationalize its citizens. Rather, it is the problem of the state's acknowledgement of being in time. If, as I've been arguing, the right to indigenous rights is located in histories of the middle ground, where indigenous and non-indigenous peoples negotiated interpolity relations, the settler state as guarantor of indigenous rights is forced to think beyond itself it must locate itself in time, at least provisionally, as emergent from those earlier histories, rather than as enduring in time immemorial. It is not a guarantor of an, or enforcer of rights as a measure of its modernity, but as a condition of its historicity. In some sense, even if just as the faintest of inklings, by recognizing indigenous rights, the settler state 
apprehends the possibility of its own dissolution. Thank you. Thank you for that, Miranda. It was really good. I'm thinking you said toward the beginning about how the, the state uh, operates through memory and trying to render itself immemorial. I'm not going to get your language quite right, but I'm wondering if you could uh, give us some examples or maybe to talk a little bit more about how you see that, that you know, oh, what it's are a the ways that really... state memory works? <laughs> Yeah, it's a term I'm really taking. I'm kind of adopting from common law practice, right? <clears throat> that the common law is a is a customary practice, you know, that has operated since time immemorial, time immemorial that it grounds itself in an authority that is not um, to be located in time and place, um, um, because to do so would be then to have to um, suggest that there could be some other version, I guess. Yeah, so I'm interested. I mean, we you see this and you see this in very practical terms in court cases or tribunal hearings that I've worked in and, and observed um, when uh, <clears throat> when judges um, <clears throat> are unable to um, consider the outside. What you guys were talking about, what you were just talking about, Katie, is the kind of outside of politics, right? The the, the court can't consider its own outside um, because to do so. Would be then to suggest that its jurisdiction is going to be uh, too um, uh, too uh, limited historically, I guess. So, so these and so and this is sort of the precisely the point where Indigenous rights legal cases have, you know, caused so much trouble for um, for uh, settler law. How does the how does the settler state recognise um, an Indigenous claim that pre-exists its own existence. On what grounds can it do so? What evidence? You know, so then a whole lot of evidentiary regimes kind of are developed to try and make that recognition possible. But it's a it's a kind of existential problem, I think. Um, yeah, and it's coming up in Australia at the moment around some citizenship cases, uh, which are probably too complicated to go into here, but involve. The deportation of people with Aboriginal heritage who are claiming, who who are asserting their um, Indigenous right to belong, but are being deported under other um, on other grounds, and this this is also kind of revealing those cracks um, as to what the state will do when it's um, threatened by something that pre-exists it, a discourse that pre-exists it. Thank you, that's quite helpful. I'm wondering if anybody else has any specific questions for Miranda before we move on. I'll save it till the end again. Okay, great. So um, I next, uh, I'm working on this paper and I'm staging this dialogue between our rent uh, it, it's trying to be an inter-American dialogue, really, uh, with our end thinking from the U.S. Uh, after fleeing Europe with Jose Carlos Mariategui, thinking from Peru a number of years before, and with uh, Patricia Monterangas thinking from uh, what she'll call in something I'll quote her uh, Mohawk land. Uh, so these are some of the voices I'm trying to bring together to think the Americas and the, and the Caribbean together with, in a way that a, a philosopher I think a lot with, Howard Glissant, would call entanglement, because the histories are entangled, so I'm trying to shift a little bit how I write and the methods I use to think about these problems, because the, the activism, at least, when we're thinking of resistance today in Peru, in the US, uh, in Haiti to gold mining, for instance, the same gold mining company. Um, uh, the dialogues, the activism is already there and I'm hoping to, to theorize a little bit more in that way, so. Okay, here we go. Hannah Arendt's phrase, the right to have rights, which she earlier wrote about in the article, The Rights of Man, What Are They? That was published in 1949 and developed famously in her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, remains fruitful to think with today. 
I started thinking in earnest with this phrase around 2020, and it was practice that led me back to the theory. Indigenous land struggles across the Americas, the Shukuru Nation on their ancestral land, the Lakota at Standing Rock, the Atahuapiscot and other nations as part of Idle No More, and many other indigenous nations, have recently leveraged various rights claims to speak against similar state and corporate-backed rights violations, claims regarding the right to water, the right to assembly, the right to culture, and perhaps especially the right to land. I found our end phrase helpful because it succinctly suggests that some rights depend on other rights, or more exactly, that some rights depend on a single right. While she has in mind the right to a political community as the grounding right, where belonging to an organized community is what matters most, as I thought about how her, tra how her theory travels to the context of the Americas, and in particular, as I thought about Arendt's claim alongside the rights claims I've heard indigenous actors invoke, in political movements in what is officially called Pernambuco, North Dakota, and Ontario. I started to think about the right to land as the right that grounds other rights in the Americas. Another way of saying this is that a first step to the practice or institutionalization or performance of human rights across the Americas, across nation states that remain settler colonial in law and social life, a first step to human rights in the Americas would be the recognition of the sovereignty of indigenous nations. Without the right to land, indigenous nations continue to face ongoing violations of other rights, a right to their cultural practices, a right to education on their own terms, a right to religion, a right to expression, and many other rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that states in the Americas claim to accede to. My claim about starting from the right to land has been summed up in protests through the line treaties, not tar sands. These points I'm making sound simple, but the social and political tasks that they entail remain immense. Here again, I find the rent helpful because as Katie Howard has suggested to me, we can read the origins of totalitarianism in dialogue with Arendt's later book, The Human Condition. And when we do so, we gain the insight that action around the right to have rights requires building power an organizational task that involves appearing with others in plural in public. And to think about what demands we activists or scholars contributing to discourse can make, I have also gained from returning to the work of Jose Carlos Mariátegui. Writing from and about Peru, Mariátegui was starting from a set of social problems different from those Arendt is dealing with in thinking imperialism and totalitarianism together in Western Europe. Mariátegui in the 1920s writings I want to talk about here, the problem of the indigenous person El Problema del Indio and the land problem was trying to shift the sociological and political framework in Peru from one that problematizes indigenous people to one that problematizes the nation state in its current iteration and especially the extractive capitalism that the nation state supports, sanctions, renders legal and violently enforces. In one of the ways Mariátegui criticized both the capitalism of his day and the elite humanitarian impulse of those governing Peru was by addressing which right grounds other rights. He says most emphatically in his 1928 essay, The Land Problem, quote, for those of us who study and identify the problem of the indigenous person from a socialist point of view, we begin by declaring humanitarian or philanthropic views that as an extension of the apostolic battle of Father Bartolome de las Casas supported the old pro-indigenous campaigns as absolutely outdated. Our first effort is to establish its character as a fundamentally economic problem. First, we protest against the instinctive and defensive tendency to reduce it to a purely administrative, pedagogical, ethnic, or moral problem in order to avoid at all costs its economic aspects. We are not content with demanding an indigenous right to education, culture, progress, love, and heaven. We start by categorically demanding their right to land." End quote. To my ear, Mariátegui's words ring as strikingly contemporary. He is, to put it one way, talking about the right to have rights in the Americas today. In my view, to take up his claim would still have tremendous consequences for how human rights advocacy and activism proceeds today. It would mean admitting that any human rights effort 
however well-intentioned, that wants to quote unquote help indigenous nations without starting from the question of land and sovereignty that any such efforts treat symptoms and not the underlying disease. These implications would further include not just governments such as the US returning what is commonly called the Black Hills to the Lakota as the Lakota People's Law Project demands, but also a shift in how settlers think about and possess land as well as how settlers remember the past. We can consider, for example, land acknowledgements at conferences and on university web pages that stop there at what should be a point of beginning for action, but stop with the acknowledgement without thinking of or changing the structures of ownership of the land or economy. In her book, Knowing Native Arts, Nancy Mithlow asks her readers how to consider how heightened visibility can, without a larger sense of responsibility, become part of event-based publicity that despite its signal and periodic attention to the cause, quote, is a component of a larger system of reception that simply consumes, regurgitates, and then ignores an awareness of native rights rather than building movement with increased power of self-representation over time, end quote. This is the point where people usually ask me if I'm just talking about property rights or if they're academics about property logics. And to be clear, I do think title matters. In an important case that contributed to indigenous dispossession in the US, Johnson v. McIntosh, the US Supreme Court ruled that indigenous peoples, though that was not the language it used, have a right to occupancy, but not a right to the land itself, which the court said came from a doctrine of discovery. So to be clear, I do see what is sometimes called native title as a part of transitional justice in the Americas. What matters especially here, I think, is how settler states and societies could learn from a right to land through an understanding of land and of rights that remains largely foreign to Western ethics and law. It is regarding this question that the Canadian political philosopher Alison Weir pointed me to the work of Patricia Monterangus, from whom I have learned immensely. Mon Monteur's language of a right to responsibility to land shows how a right to land can be understood as a custodial, not proprietary right. Monteur argues that while indigenous people experience colonial oppression differently, the end result remains the same, namely, in her words, the denial of the basic right to be in control of your life. Important to my inquiry here, Monteur thus calls self-determination, this right to be in control, a basic right. She understands self-determination not just as individual self-determination, but as a self-determination that is always already in relation to others or in relation to community. She explains, quote, individual rights exist within collective rights and the rights of the collective exist in the individual. Any hierarchical ordering that is giving a preference to either the individual or the collective nature of rights of either notion will fundamentally violate the culture of Aboriginal peoples. While highlighting that law itself has been foundational to indigenous dispossession in the Americas, Montour writes, I still believe there ought to exist a relationship between law and justice. To elaborate on this claim, she starts from her own responsibilities. Quote, One of my elders taught me that in its vast complexity, it is profoundly simple. It is as simple as I am, and I am responsible. I understand my responsibilities to myself, to the Cree man that I married, to the children that we have made and brought into this world through the gift that I have as a woman. I understand my responsibilities to my new relations in the Cree territory, to Mother Earth, on whom we walk and who nurtures all life, to Father Sky, to Brother Sun, and to Grandmother Moon, who watches over the women. It is just that simple." Monteur, foregrounding an ethical responsibility is one way to redefine political theory. And it is part of a way to begin anew, to start, she says, by recovering our Aboriginal notions of justice. As I understand this concept, she goes on, it embraces a knowledge of who I am, an understanding of my responsibilities, which are both individual and collective, and only then a sense of what is fitting, right, or fair, end quote. This does not mean that she seeks accommodation from the nation state's legal system. On the contrary, she positions herself as working in a spirit different from that of such proposals. She writes, quote, 
It boggles my mind to think that all of this constitutional debate, the number of conferences, the amount of federal money and federal energy spent trying to figure out what Aboriginal people want is merely the struggle to accept that we want to be responsible as peoples. At the center of our demands is one simple thing. I want and I need and I have the right to live as a responsible person in the way that the creator made me, as a Mohawk woman. That is the only right I need. When I have the right to live in my territory as a Mohawk woman, then I will have justice. I am disturbed by what we see in self-government, the kind of self-government where we are merely granted the authority of administering our own misery. This is not self-government as I understand it. Self-government requires the significant letting go of Canadian government power over the lives of Aboriginal citizens. I do not doubt that the release of power is a difficult thing." End quote. Three elements of this passage immediately speak to my inquiry. First, Montour starts with the right to responsibilities. That is, she starts by placing rights in a larger context. Second, Montour posits a right to land, the right to live in my territory, and then a cultural right as a Mohawk woman as prerequisites to justice. In other words, a right to land and then third generation rights are, on her analysis, foundational or basic rights. Third, she calls for the state's letting go of power. What is at issue, in other words, are not just legal, academic, and procedural questions, as would be discussed at the conferences she mentions, but also a profoundly relational and ultimately ethical question, a question that helps those of us who are settlers and the governments who act in our name to ask of ourselves, of what are we willing to let go? I want to conclude this paper by mentioning uh, three ongoing struggles for Indigenous rights in Canada, the US, and Brazil. In what is today called Canada, the first Trans Mountain Pipeline was built in 1953. The contested current project would build another pipeline and expansion from Edmonton, Alberta to Burnaby, British Columbia. Canada approved the expansion pipeline on June 18, 2019. Trans Mountain's website features a page called Indigenous Peoples, in which they say, quote, we are committed to working with Indigenous people where we operate. Trans Mountain respects the constitutional rights, unique culture, diversity, languages, and traditions of Indigenous people in Canada, end quote. Such a statement contrasts with that of the hereditary leadership of the Sequemic Nation in publishing guidelines for how guests should conduct themselves on Sequemic land in May 2021. Hereditary matriarch Miranda Dick observes, quote, Trans Mountain has broken almost every protocol ever set forward. So that's us putting them on notice as well, end quote. Further, the United Nations Committee on Racial Discrimination noted something similar in a November 2020 letter to the Permanent Representative of Canada to the United Nations. In that letter, the committee observed the failure of Canada, which bought Trans Mountain from Kinder Morgan in 2018, to obtain the free prior and informed consent of the Sequemic community regarding the Trans Mountain pipeline expansion, as well as the Wet'suwet'en community regarding the Coastal Gas Link pipeline. In fall 2021, I went to a gathering at Nathan Phillips Square in Toronto. In the western part of the country, it had been raining so hard that roads had flooded and several landslides had occurred. In response to the flooding, the Trans Mountain Corporation temporarily shut down the Trans Mountain Pipeline. At the square that day in the fall, a speaker commented on the myriad rights violations the Royal Canadian Mount Police had committed against Wet'suwet'en land defenders. The speaker also noted that amidst the rains, the land itself was responding to such a violation. In 2014, the Canadian company Enbridge proposed to build a new Line 3 pipeline, which runs internationally from Alberta to, to Wisconsin in the United States, through the, treaty through the treaty territory of Anishinaabe peoples, which includes lakes and wild rice watersheds. Thus, Line 3 violates both treaty rights and cultural rights. According to the Indigenous-led organization Honor the Earth, wild rice is the centerpiece of Anishinaabe culture, and it grows in numerous watersheds, Line 3, crosses. Although oil is currently flowing through the new Line 3, multi-faith, multiracial work to stop the pipeline continues. In fall 2021, Karem Yuchi photographed a flag near LaSalle Lake State Park in Minnesota, marking the Firelight Resistance Camp. 
The flag simply reads, we are still here. Such a reminder of ongoing presence resonates with contemporary struggles over time itself in Brazil. Also in fall 2021, thousands of indigenous people from 176 nations traveled to Brazil's capital, Brasilia, in order to appear in front of Brazil's Supreme Court to protest the Marco Temporal or time framework. Advanced on behalf of mining and agricultural interests, the legal argument behind the Marco Temporal demands that indigenous peoples prove that they occupied the land they currently claim at the time Brazil adopted its constitution in 1988. Francisco Calize, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, noted in August 2021, ironically, this very constitution of 1988 was supposed to have guaranteed indigenous land rights. And indeed, the original rights achieved through the 1988 constitution resulted from sustained and costly indigenous activism. By starting from 1988, the business-backed legal argument sought to legitimize legally the theft of indigenous land that occurred until 1988. It also sought to cast into doubt existing indigenous land claims because recognition of the Marco Temporal argument would entail reopening the demarcation process. The Shukru Nation describes the Marco Temporal as the century's most emblematic case for indigenous rights noting that it fails to consider peoples that had already been expelled or forced to leave their place of origin. On September 10, 2021, Supreme Court Justice Edson Fashion affirmed indigenous rights, quote, indigenous territorial rights consist of a fundamental right of indigenous peoples and are materialized in the original right over the lands they traditionally occupy, end quote. And on September 15th, Last year, the Supreme Court of Brazil suspended the Marco Temporal case indefinitely, leaving its fate uncertain. One of the claims that stays with me from the protests of the Marco Temporal is about participation and indigenous visibility. The text accompanying a video that circulated from the Shukuru Nation to me reads, indigenous and non-indigenous artists and communicators join the great mobilization in defense of indigenous rights. We need visibility. From this line, I read a call for what, in our end's terms, we would call action in plurality in a space of appearance. And indeed, part of what I'm suggesting in this paper is that indigenous politics and political theory across the Americas speaks most fruitfully to the how question of building power that Iran leaves us with in discussing the space of appearance in the human condition. There, she defines a space of appearance that does not survive the actuality of the moment which brought it into being. Power is equally ephemeral. Power, she says, springs up between men when they act together and vanishes the moment they disperse, end quote. She goes on, what keeps people together after the fleeting moment of action has passed, what today we call organization, and what at the same time they keep alive through remaining together is power, end quote. As I'm reading it here, the question of the right to have rights in the Americas is also a question of building power. Informed by Arendt, the political scientist Joy James writes in her book, Resisting State Violence, quote, those who differentiate between power and domination in order to link power to communal goals for social and cultural freedoms, economic sufficiency, and radical democracy, posit a vision of political community as the context for human development, end quote. Building power, in other words, remains a key task for political actors working across the Americas today. We are left, I think, with the task of adding up together, of communicating and thus connecting or making into a sum, to use the Shukuru's language, our efforts in different countries, contexts, spaces, and times. And we are left to do so in a way that situates ourselves not only as actors among, actors making demands and reclaiming public life among other actors, but also as actors within, actors within the land, responsive to and responsible to land, land that in many places is taking matters into its own hands. Thanks. I don't know if y'all have any questions. I, I realize it's weird to be speaker and moderator. Otherwise we can just go to group questions. Can I ask a couple of questions, man? Great. So I'll start with 
with your paper. Um, I'm I'm always interested in the in the way in which uh, the the histories of the representation of indigeneity, uh, especially in the in the Americas, but I, and and especially in South America, and what I know most is in the Andes. Right. So there's there's a history of ma the manipulation of the visibility and of indigeneity and the fabrication of the visibility of indigeneity that has been has a lot ha has been done you know it has gone through many different phases and whatnot. So it seems to me that that when you when you when you um, make the claim for visibility. It seems that more work has to be done in order to, in my view, um, say the the ways in which that visibility cannot will not be co-opted, um, as it has been in 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 Latin America, you know, by both conservative and progressive governments that have both been disastrous to indigenous people. So so. So that's one of my questions, the issue of visibility or what you call indigenous visibility and how central that is to, to the project of indigenous rights and how also could be a kind of point of, of exposure and vulnerability. And I actually, I think that I, Miranda, if you can add anything to that, that would be great because I would like to learn from you if you, if you have thought about that. Um, and then of course, Mariati is very aware of this problem um, because in his time, there was a whole machinery of fabrication of indigenous visibility, which was at the time called uh, indigenismo, right? And 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 that beca becomes one of the the political the visibility of indigeneity was a, a kind of political battlefield for both leftists and and, and right wing governments at the time of Mariati, and he he struggles quite a bit to to with that problem because you know it seems that sometimes when he is articulating his 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 call for the land and whatnot and the centrality of uh indigenous peoples for the revolution he is himself using sources <laughs> that are indigenista and the and he himself says look at one point he says and i know that these sources and this these characterizations of indigeneity are not even coming from indigenous peoples themselves. They are coming from mestizos, you know, they are coming from um, uh, white people from the coast, you know. So I just want to, to talk about how complicated this notion of visibility this, and uh, in terms of the co-optation of, of that. I'm not an Arendt scholar um, myself, so maybe there's, there's something there that, I, that I, I need to learn about, but I'm concerned about that that project, indigenous rights and indigenous representation. Yeah, thanks, Omar. I mean, I am I feel comfortable, that could be too strong of a word, comfortable using the language of visibility because um, that was directly the, the Shukuru's call, we need visibility. Uh, and from conversations that I had, uh, uh, with some Shukuru, uh, I don't want to. I want to be careful naming some of the names sometimes, given some of the things going on. But uh, um, there, I do think there is a role for part of their concern and part of the sophistication of their media project. I think is that without international pressure, can be a way to uh, draw attention to some of the things they're trying to achieve achieve in everyday senses. So I see that as part of the visibility, what, what the visibility is doing or why they might be asking for visibility. Now, why I think Mariatik is helpful is for the reasons you're saying of the this debate around indigenismo where uh, Mariatik is kind of joking, you know, he's, he's making fun of really in, you know, when he says to heaven, these rights to heaven, he's making fun of this humanitarian impulse that I think we've yet to transcend um, really when I think of 
uh, universities, for instance, is, was what I attempted to implicate in my paper, uh, just because that's the context we're in that I'm trying to think about our own responsibilities where we have kind of progressive, maybe at best, you know, progressive presidents. There's some worked on at Syracuse University that had to do with um, uh, reduced tuition or free tuition to for students who were accepted that were indigenous in that land, these kind of things. But in the US, this remains such a massive problem for kind of universities that name themselves as progressive, but were uh, uh, you know, founded through a Morrill land grant system that was uh, legally part and parcel of dispossession. So there's, there's a lack of attention to land that I found Nancy Mithlow's work helpful in kind of saying like, the, the land acknowledgement should be a beginning and not something you put on your website and, and leave. So, uh, and then what, oh, the, the only other thing I'll say is I think, I also hear, you know, I just want to make clear, I hear some of the calls for demand visibility that were happening around uh, uh, Nishinaabe claims in contesting the line three pipeline and Shuguru claims contesting the Marco Temporal you know, not as reflective of, of a political imaginary of those peoples, but as sort of marking the state of the struggle at present. And this is where I, I this is why I was interested in Miranda's lines about memory, because um, uh, I think contemporary ethics has a lot of work to do in speaking to how sort of settler uh, memory functions and how we proceed in, in ordinary life, um, where the, 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 if the demand is one for visibility, if it's that sort of foundational, that speaks to the state of, of what we tolerate, what you know, Fanon talks about colonization as the suspension of ethics. And it seems like that point about Algeria remains true in these settler contexts. Yeah. Uh, in the America, so I'm trying to speak to that a little bit also. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, I think I'm not against the call for visibility. I think, I think that's necessary. What I, what I'm trying to be careful is how that visibility is is, is produced. But the, yes, just, just to add to what you're saying, uh, there might be different contexts, right? Historical context, cultural context, in which this question shows up in different ways. For example, in Bolivia. Right, uh, with the work of uh, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, right? You have her, her massive book is called The Sociology of the Image. And what she's doing there is precisely trying to study very careful, like how the visibility of indigeneity has been produced um, since the colonial era. You know, and for her, that project is an essential kind of, it's an integral project to the project of a kind of call and participation in, in indigenous rights. Um, and so I, I wonder if you, if you, I don't know if you know that work, but it's super interesting uh, how much attention she gives, right, to this uh, pr production of images of indigenous. Anyway, that, that was just a suggestion for you. But... Thank you. Yes, I wonder if, just to echo your invitation to if Miranda wants to say anything um, before we go to questions. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose, first of all, I, there are ways that I think of Aotearoa as more comparable to some Latin American countries around these questions, actually, than to North America, um, given, I mean, we're, ang you know, primarily Anglophone, but we're today kind of this state is being reconceived as a bicultural bilingual one which it's not you know has <laughs> it's not materially functioning in many ways but you know is kind of aspirational um but but there has a whole set of different um uh, resonances and, and things that are going on that i think make it very very unlike say the us or at least in many parts of the us depends where you are in the us right but I suppose I was thinking about Paige Raidman's work in Canada. She's got a fantastic book. I can't remember when it came out, probably about 15 years ago now, called Authentic Indians, which is about how um, folks in BC kind of try to re-inhabit and therefore kind of ironize the ways in which they are um, 
being represented by others. And I think that's a really important um, thing to think about in terms of the visibility question, which I think can operate too easily on a binary of visible or invisible, rather than in terms of these ways of inhabiting and subverting and expanding or shifting frame, the frames in which you've been um, made, been represented by others. Um, you know, you can, and so many Indigenous filmmakers work with this and brilliant. I mean, you, you guys probably know Taika Waititi's work um, from this part of the world. Um, you know, I mean, that's, that, I think that's what that work is really fundamentally concerned with, right? Irony and um, subversion. So then co-option is not actually as, as devastating as, you know, as you might otherwise feel like. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Omar, did you have questions for the other panelists you wanted to raise? Sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm really interested in, I think that in some ways, uh, I'm interested into this notion, the notion of what happens if, I mean, that's a question you asked today, what happens if, if we read um, the right to have rights as something that contests the, the, the framing of, uh, I don't know how to put it, of appearing, political appearing, as being grounded in something like the state, right? And the state apparatus. And I think that that happened in both um, Katie's and Jasmine's um, paper. So I was more, more, I was interested in that, you know, so what, what is then if, if, we, if the state is not, you know, what the medium through which uh, something like, like rights is, is showing up, right? Um, then, what is the ground for that that struggle for rights? You know, if it is not in, anymore uh, embedded in the logics of, of of the modern state. I think um, I I just have a quick thing that I was thinking of during Ben's talk um, on this. Yeah, what is the ground? As as I was thinking about, yeah, Ben, you're positing of of the right to to land as as that kind of foundational as an expression of the right to have rights or as foundational. And I was like, well, what is the, um, Arendt's question would be, what, what is the grounding for that? Um, the right to, if the right to have rights is, um, is uh, grounded in a kind of non-grounded activity or something like that, then, then what, you know, one example that I was thinking of with Ben was like, well, then what are, what land defenders are precisely doing are sort of enacting a right to land that isn't formally um, granted, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it's, it's the enactment of a right to land that's precisely not granted or, or, grant, or grounded in any kind of um, formal state process or institution, and yet it's sort of, it's um, enacted, right, through, through uh, this sort of political activity, which, which Ben, you referred to as, as land, these, these land defenders and whatnot. Yeah, that's sort of, that's one way in which I'm thinking about how, how political action um, in Arendt's terms, necessarily operates outside of the bound, the boundaries of the state to contest, to contest the state, to um, to sort of claim certain kinds of rights that um, that have not that have not been granted, and in fact, that if one is not a citizen, then one doesn't even have. The sort of <clears throat> political standing to enact a kind of pl a political claim like that, and yet, and yet, the claim is is um, enacted nonetheless. Yeah, so it's that kind of performative um, mechanism operating from outside uh, to disrupt, as, as a rent or like somebody like Ranciere or something would say, to disrupt the the space of appearance. Um, and to enter into space 
in a way that that's not precisely um, uh, expected or acceptable or legible or intelligible, uh, but to disrupt, yeah. That was just one example I was thinking of from that Ben's talk made me think of. I think I'll add one thing to Katie's beautiful elucidation. I mean, I can we can go back to the space of appearances and it's not like a predetermined space anyway. So political or like any public space may turn into a political space by way of political action uh, where the recognition of the uniqueness or the agency of one does not come from their citizenship status. I mean, it was the ninth anniversary of Gezi Park uh, recently. Uh, and it, you know, it's a sad moment, I guess, and anyway. Or whatever uh in turkish history but uh uh or like occupy yeah like the way in which people acted or like people got together to raise certain questions and claims is not about the political rights per se people have but the ability to be able to say uh we can act and we can deliberate and we can discuss and we can become political agents we can be recognized as equals etc uh but i think going back to i mean i love the uh i, I heard a previous version of Ben's talk, uh, and I love this, the right to land understood thus, like understood in the terms he utilized, is not the right to ownership of land, but almost like a right of cohabitation, which I uh, I think it through, I think through it by way of understanding land, the land's right to be almost, like I haven't really, you know, sort of, uh, I haven't articulated this like uh, yet much, but it's just like this, the, uh, I guess, appearing of that land in its like landness or like in its ability to flourish itself and the indigenous people's claims to be able to have a right to responsibility to the land, to each other. And I loved how Ben put it in terms of like individual rights come as the collective, like, like a biconditional, like it's if and only if. It's not that we have individual rights and then collective, but they come, they sort of co, they're co-evil, yeah? We cannot understand rights without a collective. I mean, Robinson Crusoe, he was just free uh, without a, I guess, proper right claim. Uh, but I, so I think of it through that. Uh, and going back to the question of visibility, I guess, uh, I think, this, and I think this was sort of uh, uh, implicit in everything people said, but visibility isn't just mere visibility. It's also this like ability to be heard, like audibility comes with it. And again, like the claim uh, to be able to make a claim that again, may or may not be intelligible or legible to, or like there may be like some epistemic justice issues in there. Yeah, like the proper address here, the proper, proper subject of the claim may still need a bit more uh, than what they already have to be able to be heard. Uh, but to me, I guess, like, I mean, going back to your question, I think of it really through the extra legality of political space formation, because political spaces are not just like the city hall or the et cetera, or the caucus or something, but they uh, they are created and they are uh, they are contested at times. What I wanted to do in my work was to show, and I think uh, I think I will not back down from this claim, although there may be uh, meaningful organizational capacities, for instance, I uh, I want to suggest that the refugee camp, for instance, cannot become a proper political space because of the confinement, because of the inability to for, uh, for uh, cast a future, uh, because of the inability to actually act and be mobile, I mean, in a, in a very agential sense. Of course, people can have meaningful relationships, but in such a limbo, in like such a, you know, where the average, you know, residence in a refugee camp is 17 years, like where one can become of age, yeah? How does one become, and I think this is my question to Katie and then, I'll post something from Miranda and Ben. It's like the like, how do you become aware of a right to have rights in your lack of rights, like in that status, you're like in that position into which you're put. Yeah. And I think that is the that that I guess the Rancière is like the contestatory nature of some type of agency. But um, in any case, I think I'll if, if, if that's all right, Omar, I'll just pose my question, like a sort of like, you know, transition into it. Uh, I love, I mean, I loved all of these things that you said, Katie, about like, I mean, it's, 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 it's a bit like grim uh, for, I mean, for your morning, uh, I guess, uh, post coffee, whatever talk, the uh, permanent injury, like permanent injury. Oh, it's almost, uh, uh, I mean, the permanent state of not being able to uh, uh, 
be an agent, like, or like be able to have all these like ability to practice certain things. Like something is really taken away from you. Yeah, like, I mean, I mean, or like something is uh, circumscribed or something is curtailed against your wish in a sense. Like it's, you are being, uh, what is it you said, let, let live or like masquerades as let live. Uh, yet it doesn't really give the uh, ability or the, or the venue to be able to uh, practice all these other rights. And uh, if you wanna speak more about mobility, I think that'd be amazing uh, what it means for you. I read it always through Kant, like for him mobility or freedom, uh, the right to mobility, the freedom of mobility is the way in which we can have freedom of opinion. Like that's how that we becoming aware or like that enlightenment project emerges through that. And I think that's very like RM takes that up, take, takes that from him in a sense uh, where like, you know, in the camp or in the, you know, when she says in the origins quite forcefully, like people, they had freedom of opinion, but it didn't matter. Yeah, uh, They were able to say whatever, what they wanted in the camp, but nobody was there to actually take it up. Um, so that's my question for you. I want to just quickly, if I can go through it, Ben, I'm, I don't know if YouTube has anything else right now, but uh, for Miranda, I was very curious about how you wanted to, uh, if you had anything to maybe add to how you understood the, um, the, indigenous, uh, the indigenous claim being excluded from the state's temporality. Because I think of that, like I, I think that through Hobbes a little bit, like if we didn't have this ability to reckon with time, yeah? We wouldn't be able to have arts, navigation, all of these things, or like you wouldn't be able to stand in community without fear. Uh, so to me, I wonder if you, if promise keeping in the Arantian sense is a remedy to that, yeah? Because it's not about a state uh, or like it's not about common law or like the formation of any type of positive law, uh, but it's a mere human faculty uh, to be able to be together, to be able to form a community. Uh, and I wonder if the indigenous uh, temporality or spatiality uh, can, um, you know, can be sort of uh, understood through that. Uh, and for Ben, I just want you to say, could you say more about, could you, could you, look, could you please say more about like how, how we understand like self-government or self-governance uh, as this responsibility that is released uh, or that is again free from uh, the I don't know the state's uh, sovereign power because uh, to me like I read governance also like that the ability to be able to be responsible. Uh, however, most of the time it's under you know like when we think about like self determination and that becomes the problem I guess. Uh, I I hope that made sense, but I'll shut up right now. Thank you everyone for this fantastic panel. Um, There's so many great questions. I know I, yeah, and I'll just echo, um, I had similar, uh, well, I had sort of a similar question for Ben, yeah, about the um, uh, sovereignty and, and, and nationalism and how you're thinking sovereignty with a rent um, or, or if there's a different understanding of indigenous sovereignty that you're that you're thinking, um, I'd be curious. I think, yeah, I think Yasmin, I think that I am, um, I don't know, I don't think that it is more or less optimistic or pessimistic or, or what have you. I do think that, um, I guess I would, um, we probably don't have time and I, or, and I don't have the brain power to rehearse this right now, but I do think that there are, um, uh, that the that the camp, the refugee camp, at least, can be a site of, of political community and, and action. Where I, I think that you know around what she says in the origins, um, I would have to double check this, but I think she's speaking specifically about um, the concentration camp. And and I just wonder, I, yeah, I would be curious to to think with you more about what the relevant differences there might be, yeah, where she says, you know, on my reading, it's really the minimal conditions for political action really are um, uh, like the being together of, of people. And, and that sort of thing can certainly um, happen under all kinds of terrible conditions. The problem with the concentration camp, um, as she describes, in other chapters of the origins of totalitarianism is that there was an effort to fundamentally sort of destroy and transform human nature 
in, in this, um, in this way that was just sort of like in a different order for her. And so I, I'm curious, I haven't thought much about that, but I'm curious to think more about the, the distinctions between, or the relevant differences between um, the concentration camp and, and the, um, con, you know, contemporary refugee camp and whatnot. Um, and yeah, and I also, you know, with, um, I think similarly on the issue of, of mobility, um, maybe it's, yeah, it's more of a, of a on a spectrum of um, greater and lesser potentiality for, uh, for certain kinds of political agency and um, rather than all or none or something like that. Um, yeah, and, and so, and like I said, I'm still, I'm working with Puar and trying to figure out exactly what Mei Ming, how Mei Ming figures into this context because she doesn't explicitly invoke a rent. But, but there's something about the sort of deliberate um, debilitation um, of, of capacity that, as she puts it, the production or capacitation of people for debility um, that at the very least, I would think constrains the, the conditions for the possibility of, of the kind of action implied in a rent's account of right to have rights. But, um, but yeah, those are very questions I, I'm not quite sure. So. I, I definitely want to think with you more. And I, you know what, I'll concede a little bit. I think there is a deliberative aspect, like a mini politics happening, but I'm not so sure about the act of okay. We can talk All about right, well, that. that's a start. I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Okay, it's just that, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it more. I love this, the beginning of this conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Randa, do you have any uh, responses to the, some of these questions? Sorry, I'm um, multitasking because my that's son okay. is... I'm <laughs> going to require some attention in a minute. Yes. Um, <clears throat> um, I'm not, thank you, Yasmin. I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but I'll have a go. <laughs> um, um, I mean, I think you guys are, are obviously quite, if I'm understanding the conversation that I think you're involved in, it's one in which you're trying to find other political spaces and the rights that might um, be attributable or, or, or conceived in those other political spaces beyond a kind of modern statist discourse, right? And actually most of the work that I've done has been about claims to the state <laughs> and how those are made and how effective they can be or how um, complex, complex they are. Um, and, but I would say, you know, there are lots of other, and I think even in, in what you were just talking about earlier, Katie, um, in referring to Ben's right to land question, it's hard for me to imagine how that isn't. Um, at least in one dimension, always a claim to the state in our current political um, um, construction, because, you know, if you are um, protesting something going on on your land, you need, and the ultimate goal is for that thing not to be happening at some point, you need that, or what you want is for that right to be enforced in some way and it's the state that's going to be doing that or taking that away but I don't think it has to be confined to that I think that probably what's going on in so many of these discourses and um, and campaigns is that there are multi-directional and multivalent um, articulations of politics right that this inter-indigenous diplomacy and there were Maori activists who went to Standing Rock, um, Mauna Kea, Hawaiian activists and Standing Rock activists are very um, uh, closely involved with each other's campaigns, right? So there's, this, so there's there are other inter-Indigenous worlds that are going on. There are other kinds of solidarities that have been created in these um, movements, obviously, that create different political possibilities and solidarities. But I do think the state's still there. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I would just say it's probably worth thinking 
and um in multiple ways in, in a kind of range of dimensions and that's what I was trying to get to with thinking back to these um other sorts of histories these early pre-state histories where I um where I quite like this formation of interpolity relations which are not um, not presumed by and not even necessarily anticipating something like the state which will come later after contestation often after considerable violence um, but, uh, but nonetheless have become the grounds on which so much of what the state does and how it thinks about itself and who the state represents which is me and other people how we think about our history in relation to a pre-state moment. So in New Zealand, the, this is very much formed around what the Treaty of Waitangi, which was uh, signed in 1840, um, you know, and is this kind of threshold moment. So that's so in that sense, that promise keeping space, I guess, certainly um, here can have different dimensions and doesn't have to be totally absorbed by statist discourses, but you know, um, kind of disrupts them in some interesting ways too, I suppose.